All right, guys, welcome back to the uh, Bomber Podcast. This is uh, way cool for me. Um, this is episode six, so obviously I've only screwed this up five times before this. And uh, I roped in my, I get to call you my buddy now, which is really cool for me. Thank like, you. Yeah, you know, I appreciate that. But uh, I get to call, uh, roped in my buddy, Tony Rico. Uh, he and I were talking about some other stuff, and I, I cornered him on the phone call. I said, bro, you got to get on the pod. And we got to get in here and talk about some softball and some stuff. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. About life. Yeah, for sure. We're going to kick it. We're going to solve all of softball's problems today. Woo. So make sure you get your pencil and write down all the crazy shit. That's, that's an easy one, Scott. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So let's do this because I promise you, as much as I might think everybody that's ever going to listen to this knows exactly who Tony Rico is. And I know that. You try to push this whole thing away, and you don't like to talk about yourself, all this other mess. I mean, you like you like to talk about a lot of shit, but you don't like to talk about yourself very often. That's the other thing on this, Tony. And just so you know, full disclaimer: sometimes I say bad words. It's how I talk, right? I, I was I was going to ask you if you if you have a a, a mute no. button or if I if I no. get real every well, now and then. No, no, and and listen. Here's how I look at it, man. Most people that know me that know me. No, that's how he talks, and uh, I'm never going to say something so crazy. But um, yeah, I think we're getting, we're getting a little to the edge of that uh, ridiculously hypersensitive because of the you know mm-hmm. kind of reaction that we know mm-hmm. kind of comes with it. I, I you know especially I talk a lot about comedians; they're kind of coming out and they're getting edgy again, and they're they're doing all a lot of the things they used to do that wasn't cool for a while. But I, I just think it's the way society evolves. I, I, I tell people I live like I talk. You know what I mean? You know, like that's, that's D- dugout. Tony is not Yoda. D- dugout Tony is uh, no. I don't people know only knew him. if they only knew. Sometimes yes. I think he's just a dick. But yeah, know, see, for sure. Yeah, no. Like we have this disclaimer. It's like I, I love watching Pat McAfee and Pat McAfee. It's why his show is one of the best shows on TV. I like on you know because you feel like you're in a room full of dudes that you hang out with, and you're talking and they're talking about sports. And those are the guys I'd want to talk sports with. I wouldn't want to sit in a room with Stephen A. Smith and talk about sports. He'd be screaming at me and he wouldn't let me have my opinion. And he would, you know, my opinion would suck. And like, it's so cool and so refreshing to see that. So hopefully that's what we achieve here. But um, so do this, man. Tell tell us about Tony Rico. So give us some background on who you are for the one or two people that might listen to this that don't know who you are. Yeah, well, I mean... All right, we'll make it quick. I, I'm I'm just a ball player, Scotty. Like I'm I'm really really fortunate. I, I tell people, open me up, and I think that all you're going to see is baseballs fall out, and my whole history and my life <laughs> real is just a kid growing up, and somehow I don't know how I got to be this old, but I've been fortunate to be around the game. I've had some fortunate experiences that I think, uh, for me, have helped create a certain uh, a certain type of life, and I've been very fortunate. I think that I, I try to share that with others. Um, you know, not too much in the detail other than, you know, just been really like a lifelong ball player, uh, fortunate to play at certain levels, got some great friends that had an amazing mentor and coach that really changed the game for me. So between him and my family, again, gave me a certain skill set, a, a certain toolbox that's helped the, uh, the organization. Um, but the big thing is I tell people, look, like if whatever's happened to me on or off the field can happen to anyone, like I'm, I think I'm the poster boy for, uh, poster boy for behavior re- rehabilitation, right? So the, the kind of the way that we can act versus the way we choose to act. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, didn't think this could happen to someone that wasn't business oriented. I just wanted to take care of my kids as a single parent and, you know, doing something I love and pay the bills. Uh, my cousin would tell me, you know, sometimes on the last day of the month, but you still pay the bills. And uh, so I would rent, house, uh, rent, rent a house for my family. And I don't know, things are just kind of crazy now to the point that I feel like all we want to do is, and this is all of us collectively, is is help others and and tell a story because it's really not about convincing anybody. You know, we don't do a lot of outside marketing. We don't solicit teams, you know, with the alliance or anything else that you and I are working together on. We're not out trying to pull people in, but it's it's. I think it's fun to work with the obvious perception and then for people to see what the truth is. So it's even like this conversation between you and I, which, you know, I appreciate the fact that people are just going to hear a conversation between two guys that have known each other a long time in the industry, share some things. And if it helps or relates, hopefully it's relatable. Uh, 
you know, that in the end, that's that's going to benefit the, anybody that's listening. So that's all you get, man. That, that's that's, that, that's me. I'm a ball player. You, you know what? I'm going to add to it a little bit, which is which is uh, <laughs> make it quick. Yeah, for sure. I'm uncomfortable. But, I'm sweating. but I know you are. But but I think it's important that people know, like sig- for me, significantly, there's a few there's a few milestones in my coaching, I don't like to say career. It's like, we, you know, we had to coach softball and bro. like, but there's a few milestones in, in my time on the field that really stick out to me. And you know, there, you don't know there is as, as significant of moments in time at the time, but you look back and you think about things that have worked out for you. And you think about maybe growth you've had or whatever that might look like. And then you start realizing, oh, that was that. That's when it turned for me, or that's when this happened, or that's when that happened. I think players go through that too. They have, a, they remember a bat or a game or whatever that might be. Sure. And for me, there was a couple milestones that you were you played a significant role in for me, um, and it had to do with my growth. And I, you've heard me say this that uh, you're a mentor of mine before you even knew. You know you are now. Like you know that. Like genuinely, you know that. I don't have to say that, but you were a mentor for me before I told you or you recognized that. Oh, I'm having this guy's seeking out advice from me, or he's he's reaching out to me for this or whatever that is. But the significant moments that shaped when I could tell who you were and I knew it was genuine was the very first time I met you up in that sports bar in Reno. And I walked up to you and I, I literally it was like walking up to your, somebody you admire, a baseball player. Hey, can I get an autograph? Like literally you're sitting there having a tea or something. I, I like to think you're drinking a beer, but I don't think you were drinking a beer that day. I'll be I'll drink a root beer. I'm pretty sure I was drinking a beer, but uh, you were. I'm almost, I'm almost positive I was drinking a beer. I think there was more than one in front of you, but. There was, but I walked up and, and you were so accommodating to me. You are like, bro, sit down. Like, hey man, like. I've kind of heard who you guys are a little bit and like to meet you. Like you were just totally, totally cool about it. And I remember walking away from that thinking, well, not everybody's like that. That's cool. Right. Like he was welcoming in the conversation to me. He could have just said, Hey, bro, how's it going? Like, take your hand. And I try not to do that with people. Like if they go up, like, dude, I'm gonna take some time to talk to this person. He's seeking me out. It's I like wanna, the clubhouse. Yeah. Like it's, it just is man. And you, you handled that so differently than it could have gone. And uh, that stuck with me from the standpoint, like, I want to know more about this dude, right? Like, I want to know more about what he's doing. And so from afar, I secretly was watching what you were building and watching how you were going about your business and, and, and all those things. And then fast forward to 2020 at the Alliance, when you and I are battling it out, like we're within a game or two of getting to the championship game and it's getting heated like between our two teams, between you and me, like I'm trying to, I'm telling them to keep that kid in the box. Like she's, yeah, you're, you're Scotty, you're, you're, my kid's in the box. Oh, man, you're like, I'm still gonna stop claim. already. I'm, I'm let's still go gonna to the vi- let's go to the videotape. I, I, it's like that commercial. Like let's go look at like. <laughs> but at the end of the day, what was wild was I had I remember I had outside people telling me like, bro, like I saw you and Tony like getting it, like people that knew me and I'm like, fuck are you talking about? We're getting into it. Like we were in battle. It was, and it was what they don't realize is, is you put your arm around me and was walking down with me after, an, after one of the innings. And you were literally like, like we were winning the game. And you, you said to me like, bro, you're going to win this game. Like chill, chill out. Yeah, You've got Yes, like, but it was like you had your hand. It's like my, it's almost as I could feel like my grandfather, my dad, squeezing my neck, like, dude, shut your fucking mouth. Oh my god, that's so funny you say that. Yeah. No, but like it was, and it, and it, and it, and I, and I knew at that moment, like, wow, like we are on the cusp of doing something special. Don't screw this up, like I would have probably in the past, right? Totally get it. Like I would have messed it up. Um, don't derail my team. Don't all the things that you talk about with coaches about control your emotions, do all the things. And I'm, I'm, it's funny because everybody says, oh, you're way different now. No, I'm still, I'm still the same crazy want to win, want to smash your brains in guy. Yeah. I just, we, we all are. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have had any success if we didn't have that sure. little 12 but year you, old that is angry on the playground. But you taught, you taught me a lesson that day uh, among many days 
days. But that day was significantly stuck out to me because I remember you cared about my success, right? Like that was when I was like, he really does want me to be successful. Like, because from afar, a lot of people want you and I to, they want us to drive our trucks off of, off of, off a bridge, right? Like they don't want to see us be successful. And they secretly from afar want us to fail. And, and, and that's great. That's fine. Like that, I get that. I think, I think that's know? what happens once you are successful. I think it's a natural thing, right? There's, there's you know, I've, I've heard a lot of different ways to put it now. Right. So, you know, we root for the underdog and, and then, you know, yeah. uh, I was a have not for most of my life as far as, you know, how society looks at it. But I think that's a natural thing. So whether you're a player that you achieve success, right, that all of a sudden you get flipped to that other side. And so I think that's something else that we have an opportunity to help people with as well, too, is prepare for their success, how to create it and prepare for it. Because if you're not prepared for it, then you react to all that stuff. And it's almost yeah. like, well, wait a minute. How do you look at that person? your next door neighbor when they won the lottery or, you know, you're a garage band. And now that other garage band got a record deal. You're not always like, Oh yeah. Or when I, when somebody commits to a college, right. Is it always a sincere, Oh, congrats. I always tell the girls that go, sometimes I can tell when you're like, Oh, congratulations. I can't yeah. believe that, that scholarship over me. You know, it's, it's this natural <laughs> the fake thing. Laugh. Have, right. They give yeah. the fake laugh. Yeah. I'm with yeah, you. yeah. But, but you know, it's human nature, Scott. And that's, mm -hmm. I, can, I think the learn mm -hmm. part, you know, and then you bring it up. That's a good, that's a good opportunity for us to, to grow because just to your point, I'll never stop being the 12 year old. Yeah. Uh, I just put the, the, the unmanaged parts uh, away, hopefully. Well, and then, and then it was, I, I think about this last summer, you were spanking us and literally it was a, like a full circle moment. Not that I mean, you spanked us for many, oh, you spanked us plenty. But what I'm saying is like, I, there was a moment where I was sitting across and I was looking across and you guys were giving it to us. Like we were at the, we were gassed out. We had nothing left. And I was like, they're better, they're better than we are right now. And you know what? I hope, and I'm sitting there going, I hope Tony and them go win it. Like I, like I literally, I caught myself looking across the field going, Hey man, I hope they go win this damn thing. Right. Not that I didn't yeah, want that, that's Mike or anybody to else. To get to you. I think not, you know, every coach is capable of getting there. You know, you have to, you have to, there's that line for your competitiveness, right? And all of us have a fire. It's too high. It's too low. Most, most, especially coaches and players, fire burns too hot. You have that control of that flame. And uh, I've worked very, very hard on on boundaries for that because even after that, that last game last year, um, that we, when we played against you, when we played against you guys, there there were some things that the team was trying to prove to themselves uh, because we, you know, we by certain circumstances and all my responsibility, we've had to kind of push things uphill a little bit to kind of get – get back, get things back to where they were. So there was, there was some things and some significance and it is interesting and ironic how your team becomes a signature team of not, not a notch and it's not anything like our kids write it on the wall or anything like that, but they knew who you guys were and stuff. And that was a big accomplishment to be able to execute a system in a game like that. And I want to be honest with you, cause you know how low key I am about things when that game was over. I, uh, I, the feeling that I have, as you have for your kids, it's, it's it's never a competitive thing because I think you just said you you can feel how I want you to be successful. And I really, really do, right? But I remember at, we were about to go through the line and I turned around because it was a moment to myself and I went, fuck yeah. And I turned around <laughs> and you were standing right there. And I was like, yeah. oh shit, like, like, I didn't want you to see that. Like really I wanted, I was I was saying that for my kids because they, they executed under pressure, which is something they had been learning to do. Right. Exactly. And I was like, Oh shit. But I didn't want you to see that. Cause that's not a, Oh yeah. No, Scott, I look at that. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like I was like, Oh dang, because you know, Hey, we got a couple bullets left in the chamber. We're just trying to reload a little bit. So uh, you know, but that's it, competition, it, man. It goes back and forth. And it was ironic how that turned around and you were the signature win. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that necessarily, but, but what I, what I did know was, was that I had felt the couple of years, and you saw us fail the next year against Mike. Like we had back to back years, we lose the championship, and I remember you walking down the field and and putting your arm around me, and and uh, you could tell I was disappointed to have to go through that two years in a row of getting that close, and knowing that I'm the kids I had been building to that moment with, where I was going to have to hug and right. and 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 send away. So there was a lot of like that, but but for me watching watching you care about 
as you know, me as a coach, my team, my program, like you, it was genuine, man. And so when that was happening to us in real time, as the game's going on, that game got, got out of hand pretty quickly. Like we didn't, I knew, I knew it about the third inning. We were not going to probably have enough to pull this off. And your brain starts going to that place where when I pulled my Kate and Henry, who's it, when I pulled her off, like, you, you know, when that moment is time to do that, I had already also come to grips with, Hey, I'm really happy for Tony. Like I really am like this, as much as I didn't want to have to play you in that game. Um, I was glad to see you move on and have a chance to do what, uh, you know, what was next on hand, but it was just cool that, 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 that's your background. So when I ask you about your background, that's who you are. And it's important for people who wouldn't normally get to see that side of you to hear that come from me, right? Which we're supposed to be, uh, everybody wants the bombers and the firecrackers to be rivals and all this other stuff. And should I get my ass kicked by all these guys? So like they're all rivals. What's well, you, you, you're now in a point, Scott, where you get to concentrate on the 1% left, right? And, and obviously like our teams go through and for the most part, you, you know, we know this. Uh, it's like Mike's on a run and, and I think you're still on a run. Like, you know, we go up, but you have to replace talent. And sometimes it's the same. Sometimes it's better. Sometimes you're missing a couple of pieces. So, you know, what are the Vegas odds makers? But uh, I want to cover just a couple of things that you mentioned. So the, so uh, welcoming you in the clubhouse was like a, a, a big league clubhouse moment. So I remember uh, one of my buddies when he got called up with the Orioles and I would always ask him, who'd you get to talk to? You know, and he'd say, well, okay, t- today Frank Robinson taught me how to stay inside the inside pitch. And he would tell me about these conversations, Cal Ripken telling him where to eat, where not to eat. And these guys opened up their minds to them and it was kind of like tutoring them. Uh, I, I was uh, had a great year playing in Europe a year. And so I was, I think, I was the only Mexican playing in Holland. And, uh, I think it was our <laughs> third or fourth game. Third, third or fourth game there and and I had an at bat at the end of the game and 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 pulled through it in that bat and so we all meet in these canteens afterwards they're like club formats uh and so the guy that was pitching had been there I think probably I don't know seven eight years he was like a lifer there and he's sitting back with a beer and his hat's up kind of like that and he goes hey come here he goes sit down and I, and I was like all right what's up I thought he was gonna talk crud to me and he goes where, where are you from who are you and so I was like and he goes he goes, you hit my slider. He goes, nobody hits my slider in Holland like that. And, <laughs> and I just remember the way he made me feel, right? Yeah. So now the next point you're talking about where it seemed like we were getting heated, you know, again, it's really weird, right? So it's not like we stop competing, but you have a certain vision and intuition. You see where the game is. You kind of understand where your team is, you know, and, and like I think it was already eight to one or I don't know what it was. It was mm-hmm. always being. And, and I won't get into that, but the, <laughs> when you started chirping and I'm like, come here. Come here. And so, yeah, you said, grab me by the neck or grab me by the neck. Well, that's what my dad did. My, when yeah. I was running around at our house parties, my I dad did. would stop me as a little kid, grab me by the neck. And he'd say, look it, don't ever forget what it's like to see hardworking people enjoying themselves on their time off. Like, don't yeah. you forget like what me and your mom do to provide for our family so that they can have a good time. That's also part of the firecracker recipe and culture yeah. is we do that. And now go to, uh, it's funny. You talk about Mike. Mike picks us all off. I mean, he's out of red right now. So it's, it's funny. Um, you know, I remember talking to you and Dave the first year at Indiana and then uh, Bobby at, at Texas A&M, mm-hmm. they were in the facility a few weeks ago yeah. and I pull them aside and I go, Hey, when you're here, it's funny. Cause Texas A&M, they're big timers. I go, go stare at that guy and go watch him teach. I keep telling Scotty, like every chance you get to watch Mike Stith do anything, I go, don't yeah. miss it because he's the 1%. Like he's the guy that just sits on the ridge, pays attention to detail and is kind of sniper like, like he's undercover, he's stealth, he just watches, he doesn't talk, he doesn't make noise and then pew, pew, pew. And he just, he just yeah. does his thing, right? And like you said, if I sound like I'm almost enjoying it it's because I know what kind of guy he is, right? He yeah. stands for the right things. He's, he's very similar to like, you know, how we grew up, which is so like disconnected, I think from the kids nowadays, but it's, it's the old school stuff, but I don't know. All of it goes into this whole experience that we have Scotty and, and it's weird because it comes, becomes circular, right? I don't know what the hell is going to happen this summer. Right. Yeah. But we're, and we, and we do have, we do compete. So for people that want to see us go at it, well, 
I'll use the uh, analogy of like MMA, right? I mean, look what they're doing to each other and the physical violence that takes place within that sport, but the respect and the love that yeah. so many of those competitors have for each other. And that's the part that makes me cry at the end is the is the the blood and sweat equity that goes into the competition, giving everything they had. And at the end, on their knees, you know, respecting each other and keeping everything intact, right? In the way that things should be. And I think that's what I'll call it an opportunity that we have and, you know, again, whether it's part of this story or whatever, that for people to think about, okay, how are we relating to each other in this inter industry? Because I think it's really important that we realize we spend a lot of time together. Well, and and, and it, it continue, you continue to build on it. You continue to grow and, and try to make that be a more inclusive culture where you get like, I'm going to tell you when I knew, I knew I was kind of in the mix with you guys is when we were eating dinner at Mickey Mantle's and Marty thought enough of me to reach across the table and stab my, my steak and eat my steak. I knew then like, Hey, we're, we're friends, bro. Like that's what's, what it once is. Once he knows your name, you're in yeah. with it because uh, I couldn't you know, understand him because it was lives, dripping out of his, his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. But even yeah. that guy, amazing, man. That was crazy. Amazing. So opposite of like, you know, if you had a, a a dime for every time someone, you know, makes a statement about just the, the way that the angels kind of carry themselves in games, but that's all their character. That's what they do. And if we're writing a script, we're absolutely like, I think each of our brands kind of represents something different. We certainly don't want to all be the same. So no, no. when you do watch these styles, man, and I, I, you know, I don't know if it's fair to say it's, it's, you bring a strong, like, Texas style to the way you guys are playing the game and in the Southeast, the way the team, the clubs are playing in the Southeast and every region has like a, a certain ingredients or recipe to their success. And it's kind of different, right? We are, we're kind of old school, a little more out here on the West. We've, you know, we've been at this a long time. You guys are very progressive. You are setting the mark right now in the data and the metrics and all that stuff. So it's pretty awesome to see the sport grow from where it was in the nineties, man. It's, it's, it's been, it's been a, been a fun ride. So you, you just transitioned into the next thing I want to talk to you about, which yeah. is kind of the, that your program and the, the history of it. And I know your background, just having gotten to know you better through the years and how influenced you were by your dad and the military service and the honor aspect of things. And, your family's history. And uh, a lot of people see, they don't like, it's weird because they don't see the military s side of our, you know, outside of us wearing a uniform like that. They, they don't, it's not as reflective in us as much, but when I look at firecrackers, I always think back up to your play with honor. And you and I were talking about this, how that's taken on a life of its own. And it's been, it's stood the test of time and it's, there you go. There's you. That's it. My dad's dog I mean. tags right there. World War II. That, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's such a big influence in who you are. And obviously, it, it has found its way. It's weaved its way into your program and what it's about, whether you did that intentionally or in, you know, not being intentional about doing that. I can't say that un, unintentional. Um, there's certain words in Texas we don't. We don't freaking say don't, don't go above yeah. two syllables just keep it keep it yeah. simple i got you i'm, I'm trying I'm trying it's but uh, um talk about hey, talk about the history of the firecrackers as it relates to some of the incredible players you've had the chance to coach a uh, you know, coach uh some of the incredible coaches that have that have shared a dugout with you and still to this day share the dugout with you like don is like that's the don like, that's the know, dawn. Well, that's again, dawn. I, I, I want to make it quick because I always put myself in others positions like, ah, or Rico's going to talk about himself now. So, there, but there's a story that I think is relatable and it's the type of people that you surround yourself with. Uh, I, there by no means do I give myself credit for most of what I've done. I think I've been chosen by the universe. So the universe has protected me from screwing myself up and making all the worst decision in my life that permanently impacted me. So I couldn't do this. Uh, it all starts with Gary Wardine. Uh, he is the founder of the Firecrackers and the one that uh, I would say got me into this whole thing, I'd say 30, 32 years ago now. Uh, he created this program off of the cruisers and he was an amazing man. He knew exactly what he was doing. He had a great plan. He even saw what I didn't see because I think I was 26 or 27 when he brought me in and then handed over the reins to me in 2003. I started with him in 1991, I believe. Yeah, been a long time. And uh, so then Don coached, Menard. Came you coached. 
as an assistant with him, or were you a head coach? So I could, so, so Gary, Gary was an admin guy, and okay. and he was a manager. So so to a T, everything was perfectly just run. And then and he did a good job. He called pitches. He coached third for the because I I really didn't want to be involved in. I, I like to teach the game. Like that's all I want to do. Teach you how to throw. Teach you how to hit. Uh, what is this softball game? I really didn't mm. know kind of what it was. And that's what I obsess on is how we play the game. I didn't really want to get on the field. I'm not into the accolades. Nothing. Because that's about a ten year period. That was about that was about twelve years. Yeah. yeah. And and when and then probably you know again and this happens to a certain small amount of teams, but we had success right away. So you know you you think you're invincible. You think like oh man, I come from the baseball side and we're just gonna kick butt in this softball thing. But but what was happening is he had it was a really good recruiter. He had some really good talent at the beginning that he had brought over. So we did well at the beginning. Uh, came up to 18s in 1996. Didn't have a lot of success at all. Uh, I mean, it was like all of a sudden now you're getting exposed. Uh, I love to tell the story of we came up with uh, 14 players, 13 players. Nine of them tried out for Gordon's Panthers on uh, late August day, and nine of them made Gordon's Panthers, who at that time were the best club along with the Bat Busters. So nobody stole our players to any of you coaches, right? Nobody steals your players. Your, your parents choose to leave as much as it hurts. And for whatever reason and however it happened, right? Uh, so we came up to 18s with f- uh, four players and no f- cell phones. I told Gary – put a piece of paper on a telephone pole, just get me nine bodies. I just want to teach this game. You've already got me addicted. Uh, took the program over in 2003 um, and just started implementing a lot of the things that I had learned in college and playing for a great program. That's when systematically things started to fall in place as far as outcomes go. Uh, and then um, uh, Don Menard, though, coming in in year 2000. So Gary had brought him in because he knew I was not an admin guy. And Don Menard has been like a second father to me. He is, you know, he's... 80 something years old, but he's man, he's spry and he's like a 15 year old. And you spend some time with him down in Puerto Vallarta and this couple, guy lives life. Times. You want to talk about an example of how to live life, how to love yeah. life, how to treat people, how to take care of your family. Don Menard has been the ultimate example in my life. Uh, and then on our program, I mean, you know, you mentioned that I like people to have success. So I don't want to be the, the, the only front man or the, you know, so Sean Brashear has done just an amazing job. He's a vice president of our program. He is a brother to me. And, you know, again, even that perception where I think every year people are asking him, is he going to leave or this or that? And the door's always open. We've had some really good coaches that started with Firecrackers that have started their own brands. Or Andy K with Rogue, right? The Ohana Tigers. Like there's been other things. Jeff Blanco has done it with the Monarchs. And now they're, I think, Lady Dukes. Um, but that makes me feel good to, to be involved. And then we have this guy, Tony Medina, who's like a rock star uh, infield clinician. Like he just creates a, a, like a party atmosphere uh, for all ages. But it really, to me, if I'm a nine or 10 or 12 year old and I go to one of this guy's clinics, it's just I want to keep doing this. So it's kind of like going to a concert and going home, going, yeah. I want to buy a drum set. I want to play drums like he's just been amazing. So there I are there are countless. I was going to say, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I've seen yeah. stuff he's done from afar. I've never met him, and you got to introduce me to that guy. Bro, he's, he's, he, and, and Scott, he's, he's in his own level that, that, that he truly does this to, he stays in touch with the kid part of himself. I remember I, I walked up to a, 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 a clinic he was doing and with eight to 10 year olds. And I'm like, what's this guy doing with eight to 10 year olds? And I kind of snuck up. He didn't know that I was there. And I was watching the way he hit, he was breaking down the class so that it was enjoyable and it was success based, right? You didn't have a bunch of kids missing the ball and then some guy yelling at them, telling what they're doing wrong all the time. I was like, I want to do these drills. And so, but honestly, there's countless people in the firecrackers, especially now, cause we've been doing this for our, our staff, right? So you can't talk about firecrackers without talking about the women of our staff. They are just amazing. So Melinda, Robin, uh, Reagan, Juliana, Sue, they are the backbone, as you know. We, you and I, do this all day long, but we have key people that just take care of us. So I'm really, really fortunate. Uh, it's, I think, it's a running, not a joke, but I think it is. You know, I do what I do, but without these uh, people, I am, I'm living the same life that I would have loved that I live that I would have lived 20 years ago, and that was stringing together lessons and finding a way to pay my my electric bill that's too high and. You know, it's just snap of a finger. So, so a lot, a lot of good people though, Scotty. That's really what it is, is, is surround yourself with good people. I'll be honest with you, Tony. Sometimes it's intimidating. It was for a long time until I, until I got to know him even better. But it's, it was intimidating to look across the field and you had all those guys. Like, I, and you start to figure out like, dude, they got a lot of wisdom over in that dugout. We better, we got to be on it today. 
Well, you know, and we had we had Rob Wild coaching with us for a while, and he was, is an amazing coach, and he's been around the game for a long time. And I remember he would say, you know, I used to think that you guys were sitting in the corner over there scouting and talking the game. N- now that you know our coaches, and then okay, John Dakes, Norm Perez, no longer with us, but they were. It was like the Apple Dumpling Gang over there. And so when you do go back and you walk back to the dugout, it's kind of like what you thought about us taking batting practice. It's like, no, dude, they are not over involved in anything. They don't even carry equipment. They're back there tucking. T- telling jokes talking about where they're going to eat after the game like yeah. but what it is it's a collective experience that kind of combines us hanging out in the backyard as people that spend a lot of time together and then by the way we're we're, we're playing this game right now so let's play it the right way well it's not imbalanced i would bet though i would bet and you'd probably agree with this their wisdom shows up when it when it needs to when it matters and, I, and each in their own way, because, yeah. because, you know, you, you know, this, there aren't too many people that are going to tell you, Hey, take it down a notch. Yeah. And if we don't have any checks and balances, and this is, this is, I think true with a lot of guys with, and people with very strong dominant personalities. If you don't have any checks and balances, then you're fooling yourself. If you think you're yeah. always in the pocket, right. Uh, Holly, you know, so my partner with the range and, and the time that I've been spending with her has been an amazing checks and balances for me because she gives me new school education on, on all the, all the things that I that I do that can be called this or that, but it makes me very self aware of how I'm projecting myself. And and man, she posted something a couple of weeks ago that you know someone that has a bad temper is making a statement that they don't understand leadership at the highest level. And I was like, oh dang! Like if you're a yeller and a screamer, and then you see that th- that means that there's a level of leadership above you that you might not care about. But that's the competition, right, is is to professionalize and set these examples with all of those just those immature. It's emotional immaturity is the is the is the tag, but it's inside all of us. And so we never stop learning. Uh, you'll never have this game figured out just when you do. Uh, it's just picking you off with regularity over on the left or, you know, you, and that's and that's the beauty of this game, because. You can perfect the way you play it and you go about it, but you will never perfect an outcome because that's like trying to perfect the weather. Like you have no say in it. The game is the game. Mike's so smart. I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around. I personally think he let us run roll him in Indiana to make us feel good about what we're I, I'm like, I'm thinking, dude, I think he's, I think he suckered us into that. And our kids were like, they had this comfortable. And we walk out in the first inning and give up seven. Like they were just like, come over here. I want to talk to you real quick. Scott, it's <laughs> one thing. It's the amount of experience that he has in those games. And again, you know, you can't say, well, you know, he's going to win or he's going to, you, you just go to we're Vegas odds makers, right? The, the odds favor him because he has set the standard and he's done it for so many years under so many different names. And so to keep the, the Batbuster legacy alive and growing and taking it to the next level in this day and age, because most of those organizations that were dominant back in the nineties and early two thousands, they're done. Like they folded when they couldn't progress with the game. Right. Yeah. So, and, and, and it feels good. He's got to be sick of me probably talking about him. Like, okay, just let's let it go. But I, but I work next to him. Yeah. Right. And which that's is, been an, an interesting unique. collaboration to yeah, watch everything really. that happens on that side of the building and the way it is and the way these, these two neighbors are so different, but yet, man, I'm glad to live on the same block with them, you know, speaking in business terms that we work right next to each other. That's a whole nother podcast. If we could just talk Mike into getting on with us, like it would just oh, he'll do like, it. Yeah. Like I could just sit, I could be in the middle and just ba- bounce stuff back and forth from you guys. But I don't know how no, many you people know, pull on this platform, but you pull Marty in too and you're going to, you're going to, yeah, we're, we're going, definitely yeah, not going to no, be we boring. Can, we can put, yeah, no, we can do it. We, it, you, as what's interesting is I tell people this, like, you know when you and you know this as well as anybody. You know when you step into a dugout and you look across the field and you're not thinking about how good the other team is. You're thinking about the guy in the dugout or the the girl in the dugout, and you're trying to figure out what they're fixing to do to you. Like your brain starts going to a different. Like you already know they're good. Like the team's good. Like what's coming from this person? Are they going to do this? That person's this? the one making the decisions. They're the yeah, ones, you know, but creating you know, the They're the quarterback, right? But Who's you also know when you look it? across and you go, now we're good. We're good. Like that happens too, right? Like we're going to be yeah. all right. right. But you also look across there and there's Tony Rico or Mike Stith or Marty Tyson or whoever, Ryan, you know, Ryan from the Aces and Greg. And then you start looking at those guys, you're like, uh, all right, this is going to be different today. 
this is going to be a oh, well, look at the amount unique. of great programs now scotty there these yeah, these tough. people they're doing great all over the place i mean look at jeremy higdon last uh last summer and kind of what they're doing like you know all over the place like that's it's tough sport to play if you have to be on top to prove your value in this and i get wanting to be and expecting to be but again, then you look at who has done what you do at the level you do it at or above it. And that starts to filter out. There's not many people up there. And that's why it's just that thine own self be true. And, and you know, we're, and we're talking about performance playing, right? Championship standards, you know, say that the bat are like the New York Yankees with their longevity, their history, and they've set a great standard. And, and so that means it's great to get to play them. You yeah. know, it, it's fun to get in a fight with them and to see, okay, how prepared are we? Hey, all right. It worked, you know, but like Mike knows, Mike doesn't care what happens from, uh, I'm going to say late August all the way till probably the championship series. Everything else is just learning. But once he gets into those tournaments, as most of us do in those particular games, as our families know, that's not, you know, equal playing time. That's, we, we got to play to win here, which is yeah. what they do at the next level. Yeah, yeah for sure. So talk about some incredible players like that people would that maybe wouldn't know that were firecrackers before that they would be. And it's easy. I know it's easy to talk about the household names, the Lauren Chamberlains and those guys, and you should. Um, but some of these people become fans of really incredible players. They don't realize, oh, that kid was a firecracker. I had no idea. Like, does, does the world know? And I know they know most of it. Certainly on the West Coast, they know it. But somebody that's living in Florida or, or West Virginia, or whatever, would they know that Sis Bates was a firecracker, right? Like think about how incredible that was. I had to play against a team that had Sis Bates and Taylor Van Zee, which I will argue with people might've been one of the best left sides I ever took the field against. Like they were nasty. It was certainly fun to, fun to coach, you know, well, Ta Taylor was a, was a shortstop too. So, I mean, that, that's not uncommon in college for, for to take the the athletic kids and moving around. And I like an athlete at third base, especially for the slap game and being able to move forward and laterally. And they play Tony. <laughs> but, you know, Sis is, Sis is a great example of humility. Uh, you know, again, uh, this this is a very demanding sport. So for the sacrifice that her, par or her parents and her dad really made and allowed her to have driving down to play for us, those long drives to you in Texas are, are not uncommon. Um, but it, it's a story of sacrifice, you know, you, I, the shelf life of players to, to stay, uh, relative after their playing career, or even as they reach the pros, it kind of diminishes a little bit. Yes, uh, college world series is the height of, of right now is the height of their career and their notoriety. But I, you know, a couple of things come to my mind and, and these aren't household names, but the firecrackers that I think of the very first one that I think of, and it's going to sound funny, but we had a kid named Holly Street. Back in the 90s, that uh, man, everything was great. I remember the first time I saw her work out, 14 years old. Man, she just was had it all going. And then she gets into college, and second year, and she just hits depression. Uh, she develops an eating disorder. Uh, she calls me and tells me she walked off the field and she went to get help for herself. So, you know, you just, man, that's a tough one to deal with, the eating disorders. She calls me about six months later, says she's doing really well. She's kind of rerouted things. She feels so good that she feels like she can uh, climb Mount Everest. I said, well, why don't you? And I just kind of threw that out there. She calls me three weeks later and says she booked a trip to Mount Everest. And on June, <laughs> I think it was June 21st. I think that's Jen Schroeder's birthday. Uh, she had booked a trip and she landed in Tibet. And she got up to, she didn't get to the top of Mount Everest. So a kid coming back from um, an eating disorder and, and rerouting and learning. And that became a part of her. And then showing me the picture of a little painting that she got from a gentleman at the bottom of the mountain that would paint the sunrise and the sunset and how it would look to him. And he lived in a little grass hut with no electricity, no anything. And she told me, Tony, he was the happiest person I've ever met. And it was her perspective. So there's That's one cool. quick one. And then we have a, a kid named uh, Bella Sakara that she um, she's married now. She played at University of Utah, but when she was 15 years old and she was kind of a kid, you know how we adopt kids and kind of look after them a little bit. And uh, she had took a fall from four stories from a building. She was up talking with one of her friends and she fell and she broke her neck. She shouldn't have lived. And uh, I remember getting the call from her mom, going to the hospital, her squeezing my hand and watching her come back and realizing that she, in her words, the way she tells the story, she, you know, she wasn't supposed to survive that fall and the way she's kind of rerouted her life. And she works with the behavioral sciences right now in, in Utah and she gives back and she's like, a, 
man, she's just a great, great person. So not names that people will know, but yeah. every coach and every team has, uh, has these kids that, you know, these are organic stories about what kind of people they are. Uh, you know, you're, we're going to turn this around and you're going to, you're going to come visit me on, on my podcast, but you know, sure. Scotty, you talk about play with honor and, and that's just being thankful. It's, it's the deeper part of the people that we spend our time with. And I think that came to me because, uh, I think by the year 2005, I'd been to about 10 softball funerals and wow. most of the churches were filled up with softball people. And I realized that, man, at these funerals of people inside softball, right? So whether it was a car accident or an illness or something like that, most of the people in this church were softball people. And I was like, whoa. So we fight every weekend. We badmouth each other. You know, they took my players like, rah, rah, they're nothing but, them. and then something happens here. We are supporting you and your family. So I think Dave King called it that dysfunctional softball love. You know, it's yeah. there. It's just. It takes big stuff to happen for us to really kind of realize it, you know, so hopefully sure. that's the example you and I are is it, it we wouldn't have to wait till we get bad news about each other. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, oh, I love oh. you, bro. I love too, man. The, uh, I, I want to, it's something I just want to dawned on me. I was thinking about, we were just talking about sis and Taylor, you know, what I was thinking about the, the other, I was thinking about this the other day and it, and, and it was crazy because uh, we were talking about how much the game has changed and the, how how the slapping in general has had to evolve a little bit. It's had to become more of a play out, dump it in, like you'll know, have some power and then use the short game. We're back in that time. They it's came okay. along. That left side of your infield was playing to let that at the right time for you. Those two talented kids, the run, being able to make those throws on the run, were a byproduct of all that short game stuff that was happening during that time. Right, like yeah. that was an incredible time to have Sis Bates and Taylor Van Zee on the left side when it that was probably the height of the short gamer stuff. You know what I mean? Like, not that it's gone. Yeah. So I was fortunate enough to go back to uh, when Natasha Watley's dad called me uh, to come over and her, you know help her swing the bat a little bit. She was already kind of a um, a standard setting slapper early two thousand. Like Natasha, Caitlin Lowe. Uh, I'd actually go back to the Arizona slappers, the touch slappers. So yeah. Andrea is the one. Mike Andrea is the one that brought me mm -hmm. over. And told me that if I was going to be successful, I needed to learn slapping. I told him I don't need to learn slapping. I'm going back to baseball if I have to. I was just a complete idiot to him, and he just he didn't even respond to me. So I was like, all right, go down to Arizona, and I, I met Amy Shellevold. So the the original touch slappers. The run and touch, uh, get to first base as fast as you can. Still, the thing that I believe in most to put pressure on pitchers. Uh, that was they were the pioneers. They started yeah. it. Uh, now we've got a kid in our program, a couple kids in our program that their moms. Uh, in fact, one of our outfielders, her mom was one of the original Arizona slappers back in the nineties and championship players, and just amazing to see all that stuff. And it did. It, it got it to a certain level. Uh, the game continues to become more athletic. Uh, you know, the triple threat lefties, I think, are are very, very important so that you can mm -hmm. neutralize defenses. You know, that does everything from scouting reports to heat maps and, you know, what you have for breakfast that the opponent knows now. So the, the more that somebody can look at that and go, ooh, okay, that's not such an easy solution. This is now going to be a chess match because she's well equipped. Now, what is what do we think she's going to do versus what she's going to do? Like we tell yeah. our kids, look, if I know you're going to slap, I can pitch to that. I can pitch to your bunt. I can pitch to your swing. But if I pitch to one and you do the other and I guess wrong, yeah. oops, there it goes. It's, it's true. So, no, it's fun part about slappers, the ultimate weapon. I love them. I love them. No, it's it's just you know, my daughter was a slapper. I, I I tell it, I say it like when she played and she graduated in 2012, graduate college in 2016, you could play, you could be a short gamer. Like just like she was a bunner slapper that didn't have a swing away game. She'd had a hard time really coaxing her way through this level of, of softball today and how people defend and what, you know, giving up a side of the field now and just different things that are, that are happening that make just being a predominant short gamer really a difficult task. You got to be really, really talented. You be bouncing balls. Let's do, let's do one of these just on slapping. We because should. I think I think that again, there's there's certain perceptions. Obviously, there's been the rule changes and things like that. But the it's a it's a very relevant part of this game. It's a very important part of this game, and I think that it creates value to the ath athletes in this game that may or may not be successful on the right side. And there's all of these like, and I understand these traditional beliefs, but we've turned lefties around their junior year in high school, and their their value just shot up because it's it's the way you're teaching. And if you're teaching something that is so involved and in depth that it takes two to three years to develop skills. Okay. That that's a certain way of learning it, but it actually can be a very simple skill 
yeah. to implement and and greatly dramatically affect the game at the highest level when you're facing the higher level pitchers and such like that. So let's do that yeah. sometimes, Scott, because that's that's a that's something in itself that I don't want it to be a lost art. I think some people are being discouraged because of the out of the box calls. Yeah, uh, we need slappers. If slappers were all hitting 750, then I would have understand we need to reduce the population. Let's call them out over and over. But they're not. They're a critical part of it. To see Pat yeah. Murphy remove his his leadoff hitter as a slapper because of the liability that was as she was being called out of the box in like a That's super a regional just crushed me. Yeah. But the shame. game is growing. You know, we go through things, and so that and that's that's not happening to that degree nowadays. But uh, you know, it's kind of crazy though. Well, I, I that, wanted to, and again, this is your deal, but I, I want to talk a little bit about, about the college game because, yeah. you know, now, now there was a point where, and, and the influence across the country now and the amount of players that you have, you know, just getting it done is ridiculous. But the, the overall landscape of obviously Oklahoma doing what they've done, uh, Patty earning her way to the top and creating that standard that she has. But outside of that, who do you see that in the end could be there? And, and sometimes when I ask that, you know, there might be a name or a team that might not be in the general population's conversation to go, keep your eye on so-and-so. So yeah. who do you think get, get, is getting it done or is playing the game in a certain way and might be there in the end, potential last four teams or championship series? Yeah. That, and and I, I have an affinity to it, both these teams. And so um, it, it, part of it's coming from that direction. But if you really just pay attention and you look at what their success is, you can take that out of it. And Texas is, is a different animal right now. Like Texas, like they went into Florida state last night and run a little 10 like on the road, like, like that's not, that don't happen to Florida state. And Texas is, is about as complete a package as you would have to put together to be able to compete with OU, right? They don't have any holes. They're deep, deep in the circle. They've got four starters with, they're all different. You know, they're just scary that way. They can, they can run an arm out at you. That's you didn't see yesterday. Yeah. You know, it's just tough. They are the fastest team in the country. Like they are, there's not a faster team in, 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 in college softball than Texas. I mean, with what they have um, and they, I think they their team batting average is like four thirty, like that's their team batting average. I think I think it was I checked yesterday. I think it was four ten. You know, Mike yeah. White's my, my boy. Like he's he's yeah. we go back and at night and I replayed for us, and so I've always had a yeah. I've been a fan of his and obviously people that know him or a lot of people don't know him, but he was one of the world's best pitchers. And so the competitive side is there's nothing he's afraid of. Um, kind of interesting. I think they were one in hitting and two in pitching or is it the other way around? They were it's one and scary. two yeah. in hitting and pitching. Um, and yeah, so that was not a fluke. And I think last year was when they had the tough start and then they came and they bounced mm -hmm. back. So, and it's kind of like that, right? When you see a high level team. So this year, like, you know, people watching UCLA not, do well at the end of last year, then getting off to a rough start. I, I think they've only lost one game this last month or something. So these yeah, programs sure it that it's interesting to watch that when they do bounce back, when they do hit these rough spots. And now Mike's been rolling through for a while, and he's definitely got some good odds. Here's They're an interesting tough. one: um, their their team defense. You know where it's ranked, Texas. It's it can't be super high. It's number one fifty seven. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so again, you, you, you look at the, uh, the possible Achilles, is it, does that mean first and third plays? Does that mean, you know, some chaos on that you create uh, against them? You got great pitching. So how does that factor to that one coach is going to come in and go, okay, let's that if that's an area where they haven't been as efficient and it might've been just a, something that you're a tough run, but you, you look at those things, you look at who's solid across the board. Uh, here's one for you, uh, Florida. So Florida now has revamped their pitching staff. Uh, they've got two great pitchers. Uh, they are like one, two, and four. I think Florida is leading the country in fielding percentage. Which and they always they're, do. They're like in top four and the other two yeah. pitching and hitting too. Tim so, plays well. Uh, LSU is the other one that I was going to tell you about. Like yeah. they're I, – I feel like everybody on their team is 37 years old. Like they are an older team, bunch of six-year seniors with the COVID year. Yeah. Battle hardened, like they are, they are really, really talented team, and it hurt them. I, the kid that played for me, their third baseman, Dan Coffee, tore ACL, and and that's been their leadoff hitter. Mm. Um, yeah. And that'll 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 have a little bit of an effect on them 
you know, who's leading that off now, Briggs. Briggs, and that that yeah. that combination of Briggs and Coffee. I think I saw somewhere they had they had played a hundred. She, she's seasons. dynamic, you know. You could see when when uh, like I would say you could tell when there's pedigree in someone. So Briggs is the daughter of a ball player, and Ken's yeah. a great coach, and she's just the way that kid plays the game. She's fun to watch. I like watching LSU. I like watching uh, Beth coach. I like uh, I like she's watching uh, Yvette Gerard call the game, call the games. You know, it's yeah. like um, uh, Scott. Uh, oh gosh, why am I forgetting his name? does the Clemson's games. He's, he's one of the funniest guys around and I'm so mad at myself. I'm forgetting his name right now. Cause I met him through Kendrea, but he's funny. Like he's a great commentator. Yeah. And uh, so, but LSU is fun to watch. I enjoy watching their games on ESPN. Duke, Duke will be another one. Duke is, is different. Um, that's a, uh, what Marissa's done out there has been really cool to see. I think they're really proud too. of her. Yeah. You she be. was on our 94 championship team. So Marissa, Marissa Young and her sister were in my backyard in the beginning days where I was convinced I was going to be doing that for the next 30, 40 years to pay my bills and little 25 foot cage. And man, her, her dad, that family is one of the hardest working dads to see what they've done, to see what she has on her shoulders, what they're dealing yeah. with, with uh, James situation, the great job he's done with the Dukes and just all of that stuff. I'm really, really proud of Marissa. Uh, yeah. You know, I like the examples that a lot of these, and I, I want to say all of the women at the college level are setting. Uh, they are very strong. Uh, it's like our CEO of the Alliance, right? Jamie, like it's like, it's like they have the shoulders that are built. They understand the professionalism that that's, that's needed. Yes, they're still competitive. They have, but they don't misrepresent in a way to where I feel like if someone's watching the game on TV, they're going, "Oh, geez, there's, they still got a little bit to learn there." So there's some yeah. awesome female coaches that they are doing exactly what they should be at that level. No question. The sport, I, you know, I think that's that was was I was going to ask you. You know, we've been talking college softball, um, and so this question basically goes for both, but. How yeah. do you like where the sport's at? Do you like the direction it's going? Oh, yeah. I know that's oh. part of why the alliance became a thing is, is we all were getting to a place where we just didn't like where it was going. We were breaking our players, and we just didn't think it was really the right path. And um, where do you, How do you feel about wh where it sits today and where you think it's headed? Yeah. We'll, we'll call them bar barbershop, an old-school term uh, conversation. Everybody knows what's wrong with softball, right? Everybody knows mm -hmm. what's wrong. So we we were just having those same conversations of not so much in a negative term, but like how how can how can this car be better, right? And so once COVID hit, uh, it was you guys. You created the TFL, and that was the first pin that dropped, and everything fell in place after that. Like it was just – I remember the aha moment uh, when you guys had announced that, and Mike and I – had a conversation. I said, that's it. This is it. Like this is, we've been waiting to replicate the, what happens in the NCAA. And so really, really proud of, of, of the collective experience and success inside that's unmatched, man. I mean, there's, you're, you're not going to match that as far as the collective success on the field and the experience with all of the years, how many 20, 30 year plus people we have on the inside of the Alliance. And then the actual, message is we want to create a gate and create a path for everyone to create their own success. So it's not about oh, where there's, it's a money grab, right? And Rico Stith and uh, Smith just want to pull people into their organizations, right? So that perception that is understandable out there, because uh, again, kind of an uneducated and obvious one. And we talked about once people have success, how people kind of look at them. So we get that. But the truth is really, um, is being able to help people. So down here at our level, I love it. College level, come on, man. I mean, you can't watch an SEC game, and now what? Now a uh, an ACC game. I mean, the the conference growth is crazy. Look at look at the look at the rankings now. The Big Ten, right? Uh, I mean, the Big Twelve, and uh, you know, Big Ten is is going to be interesting to watch, like in the future. But the SEC, the ACC, right? The poor little pack out here is, is just, you know, it, it's been awesome to watch, Scott. And you turn on the television. I, I, it used to be the, 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 it was a brother behind the LSU backstop that was always notable, right? I don't think I see him around as he's much. There. You know, I think no, in the he's fan. Still there. And now you, the fan behind the third base yeah. dugout at Alabama that wears the overalls, like yeah. she's always there. Like there's, yeah. there's, I remember growing up, there was the guy in the rainbow Afro uh, wig that he would be at all the <laughs> baseball games and he would be behind home plate and stuff. Yeah. So these fans, these, the, the park atmosphere, the, the, the crowds that are coming to the game. Oh my God. I, I love being part of this right now. It is great to watch and knowing we still have a ways to go to, to get, I like the way the game's being played across the board now. Um, 
you're not looking at five great teams. So the top 25 in, in the rankings is that can switch out. Uh, now I'm just waiting for the market value to find its place because these young women are, have everything that, that marketing looks for, except they have on top of like even their physical appearance and their behavior and stuff, they're intelligent, they're well-spoken, they're creating great brands. So we're waiting for those big companies to come in and go, look, man, let's, let's own a team. Let's own a, a pro team. This is a big thing that Mike talks about. Let's get some Toyota money in there. Let's get some Ford money in there. Let's get something and start giving these girls a platform to continue to play and play the game in a way that's entertaining. Because if it's not entertaining, this is all just a noble cause, man. We're just, we're helping out a, a group, but it's, it's not holding us down. I really like the way the sport's being played. You know what? No, I do too. I love it, man. I love it. It's, I mean, be able to turn a TV on, go on, and there's a hundred games on. I mean, it's incredible. You know what Amazing. I just wish, bro? Like, I just wish that somebody with the MLB that has the, the, the clout and the stroke to do it um, would sit in a room one day and go, you know, let's start with eight and let's take a corner, a corner of about a 500 by 500 foot section of our parking lot, like the Dodgers. Just take a corner of, of, of the parking lot at Dodger Stadium and put a softball field there and have the Dodgers fundamentally own the team and the same ticket people, the same ushers, the same, all those same people facilitate the operational control, uh, the operations of the, the team. So when the Dodgers are on the road playing in New York, there's a softball game going on, right? Like, so the fans still get an engagement all the time. You don't have to worry about competition. You're not competing with them. The Dodgers are still making money because that's what everybody worries about. Well, if I, if, what if I like softball better than baseball? Well, what if you're not – you get some fans that like softball, you get some fans that like baseball, and you get some that like both. Like, at the end of the day, you're still making all the money. Like, you're good. Why are you worried about it? And you're taking a corner of your parking lot to put a softball stadium on. Like, it's nothing. It's nothing. And that's all it would take. And if it happened, it would, it would, it, it, it would explode. It would explode. And the Astros would only team. The lot Dodgers would a lot, a lot of that, as you know, this you you've been on the inside of, of of Major League Baseball. It's traditional and thinking, and that doesn't make it bad. It's just that's that's what they do. So you look at yeah. the where entertainment meets sports, right? And and so NBA, NFL, MLB, they all have different perspectives on how to integrate entertainment, or do we keep it the way it's always been? So baseball is making its changes for more fan engagement, things like that. We've talked about that, but I'm really curious in. You know, why is the WWE social media engagement, you know, three and fourfold what the other major league sports are or, or the pro sports are? It's because of the entertainment factor. It's the storylines. It's the personas. It's the brands. It's the characters we hate, the characters we love. It's this. It's, you know, people know wrestling's like not real, real, but don't say it's not engaging. It's not athletic. There isn't a price to be paid at the end of the day. I mean, the, the amount of wear and tear on the body. So it's, it's sports entertainment. It was, it was what it is. Uh, let's bring in the owner for the Savannah bananas. Are you kidding me? Like look, look at, and so in the end, he's creating an environment that when people have a choice on where they want to go, uh, not only do I want to go to a banana game now, get me tickets. They're on tour. And what is that? That is now a rock band. That is a concert tour. That is. So I'm interested and you're in this progressive space and, and it's, it's never with the, um, you know, Oh, we have to, because I'm completely unqualified for this. It's, it's playing house. It's playing. It's make believe when we were kids, we're just doing it with real microphones and cameras and stuff. But I mean this, you know, I, I always tell people, look, I, I'm just mimicking what Johnny Carson and Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas and all these variety shows that for whatever reason I used to watch them growing up. Yeah. And so if nobody was listening to any of these conversations and Scott, you and I would just be talking on the phone about something else between each other, but we'll hopefully there's a shit. couple people out there that go, Hey, you know, yeah. and telling a little bit of the story, you know, I think that that's important too, but there's so many, there's so many things that tie into this and I'm really interested in, entertainment um and not at the expense of the integrity of the game because I'm, I'm a ball player 
Mm-hmm. So, but I have, I want to be progressive. I, I don't want to be the typewriter and be fighting on why people still need to be using the typewriter. I want to progress with the sport. And I think that there's a lot of entertainment factors and potential for these young ladies. Look at their TikToks. Look what they're yeah. doing every, every, every time you, you ask a group of kids, uh, you know, when do you watch a TikTok twice or, or an Instagram reel twice when it's interesting? How long does it take you to know that about two seconds? If it's not interesting in two seconds, what do you do? Swipe, yeah, go to the swipe. next one. So they're they're in this little pocket of they know how to turn it on, make a smile, right? Do something and create some type of engagement from their friends. They understand the like, right? And now look at recruiting videos. My name is Ma. I'm a 2000 yeah. Ma. Uh, I play Ma. Yeah. It's like some dad has made her stand there with in front of the camera and introduce yourself or something like that, right? It's yeah. like so there's a lot of space to 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 step into and. And what, what's the worst we're going to do is like you said earlier, we're just going to make more mistakes. It's all right. We just okay. fast forward people's learning curve between our 50 years of mistakes we've made ahead of them. Bro, you want to, Hey, you want to hear something just before I forget about it? I heard this and I haven't been able to corroborate this, but, but I heard Dana White say that, he, you know, he purchased slap boxing, the, the, the whoever started he, Dana White purchased it from their views and their social media engagements are the, like number one. No, like they're number one, like they're bigger than, UFC bigger than all that stuff. Slap boxing because it's entertainment, like you just said. Uh, he created a platform for it. He gave it some structure. He did all the things that you would want to create something viable. And uh, it was nuts. I heard him say that, and I was like, I get it. We'll talk I'm about a short it, burst of short burst of engagement, right? You you yeah. don't even have a five minute round to wait. You have one slap to see if one person's <laughs> going to go down. Yeah. So yeah. is that like uh, the ultimate buildup from the Three Stooges that we watched growing up? Like, what what, what, what is this? And and he's impervious to the to the obvious of like, are you kidding me? Like, this is like CTE going to be happening like all over the place, order. So there, you know, there's that whole discussion, but you can't deny engagement, and it comes across your reel, and you're watching it in those two or three seconds. It's it's the half a second of the slap, and then. Ew. And that, that's all we need to see, right? Well, it's, it's at this point, it's nothing I'm going to do a pay per view for, but uh, but I, I I have bought the bare knuckle fighting a couple of times. Are you? It, it's I, just stuff that people respond to. Are you going to spend money? And I think, bro, I'm fairly confident. I got to go look back at the date, but I think the Mike Tyson Jake Paul fight is when we're all together in Indiana. We're got to get oh, together damn. and watch it. No, we got to get together and watch it. And so we have to have Marty Tyson in there with us. For sure. I think Mike Tyson's going to beat him up, too. My, my, my son's uh, an, a jiu-jitsu instructor over for Kings MMA, and that's Master Rafael Cordero. He's the one uh, training Mike Tyson. So, you know, he's constantly posting reels on when yeah. that guy hits the mitts and he's hitting those things. Sometimes it looks like Master is like – it's not that he's scared because he was in shoot to boxing. It's just guys are very like very yeah. capable guys, but it is intense how hard he still hits and entertainment, man. I mean, most of that stuff, I, I think I went through this with boxing because I loved watch boxing growing up. And then I just got to the point where it's like, I go do a pay-per-view and I was like, this, this was almost like going to a softball tournament. Why did we do this? Like, I don't want to do this yeah. again. Like, you know, yeah. that's kind of how things evolved. Uh, I, I'm in on that one though. That's for, I would just say uh-huh. for entertainment. I don't know what the rules are. What the whatever is just as long as it's good entertainment, but did you hear what Tyson's Mike said? Fairly boring. Did you hear what he mm-hmm. said? Did you hear what he said? He goes, Who? I'm gonna end him. Like, I, I'm not doing this for money. He goes, I don't need money. I, and he goes, I like Jake. I like Jake Paul, but I'm gonna end this dude. Like he's boxing it. I'm gonna be the guy. Mike, he goes, This is gonna be my legacy that I ended this dude. <laughs> and, like, and that's that's what creates views and that's what's going to make people want to watch it's, it's always that disruption right you all you, without the oakland raiders without darth vader yeah. without like something i mean then everything is just kind of blunt so in one sense on this i'm 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 fighting for everyone to love each other in the world and kind of create a peaceful experience but then on this end of it there are arenas of engagement and look it's not like the roman gladiator so it's not like heads are rolling all the time but there's this yeah. a, these are arenas of engagement at all different levels shoot there's a documentary on this kid uh, world champion chess player and it's chess and you watch that and you're like going oh my gosh this guy plays six guys from harvard and the kid was blindfolded 
and they would just tell him what the moves that were making. And he beat all six players from Harvard blindfolded. He was this world champion. That's intense competition, man. But it's not like he's pulling muscles doing it. No, that's, yeah, that's legit. Not bleeding I'm afterwards. Down for that. Yeah. Well, we're getting towards the back end of this. Uh, you know what it's like to pull an hour of uh, Tony Rico's flies time. Flies by, bro. Yeah, time flies. So, hey, let's talk about your team, your current team. Now, you guys, you and Sean, you mentioned Sean earlier. And for those that know him, he's My yeah, guy. a yeah. firecracker for sure. Yeah, for sure. And so you and him uh, made some some moves, man. Talk about your team and talk about what you guys did there. Maybe give us some insight to your schedule a little bit this summer. Maybe a player or two to watch out for. Uh, so the the how, how do you not? I kind of figured this out after we created the select program a couple months afterwards. Um, you know, again, I'm not a competitive sit out, watch games, recruit kids, come play for us. Uh, honestly, I would get kids to show up on our doorstep as sophomores in high school. So the Van Zees, the Bates, the Chamberlains, the whoever, and let's just go. Let's just teach them the game. And then I started working next to uh, Mike over here in the facility and started noticing these 10 and 12 year olds pushing sleds with this obvious ambition that they're going to Oklahoma. And I'm like, what the heck is this dude? They're looking at me like, get out of my way. I don't know who you are, but I'm working here and I got a goal. <laughs> And, and then here we are over here with neon signs and I'm making t-shirts and hitting rings for targets and all this crazy stuff, but you can't be next to that and not be inspired. It's not a negative pressure because I create my own life experience. So I'm not about negative pressure or things that I have to do. These are things I get to do. So I thought, okay, we've had quite a few kids that were in our program at 12 or 14 or, 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 and that left to other programs just cause I didn't even know who they were. I said, all right, why not start working with these kids a little bit younger? I, I don't want to do 200 kids, but let's create a select program that allows the best players from the firecrackers to be able to be recognized. And it's starting here on the West Coast. So we've got three uh, select teams, two 16s and 118. And Sean and I coach the 18s. And then we oversee the development of the other teams. And we're starting to network and we're working really well with these other coaches. Because even that, right, does do your younger level coaches want to just lose their players up even in its own organization and then have to fight for themselves? So you can't extract and then leave someone just bare bones and now they're, they're fighting. So all of these things are kind of integrated. So it's really slow. But the inspiration came from watching Mike. And I think a few months ago, I think I told him that. I just said, hey, so thanks for the select program. We were talking about something. He looked at me and he didn't even blink. He goes, you're welcome. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's about time you work a little harder. Uh, <laughs> he's just that guy. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, really, really slow. Our, our intent is to create. A, because you got to watch these recognition programs and the subjective part of it. And then there's criteria. Then there's people that want to be this and be recognized, but they're not. Then they get mad. And so there's this whole thing, the way our softball society reacts. But we want to create a platform so that the best players in our organization have an opportunity to get the education uh, and some of the dialogue that the best players need to have. So I'll be honest with you, I hadn't even realized that Jayla Wright was on one of our firecracker teams, the Duke pitcher, man, I think she's leading the country in ERA right now, right? So when she was in one of our Southeast teams, to be able to meet online, talk with them about what social politics, branding, a lot of different things, the, the mentality of playing the game at that higher level and reducing your your mindset, you know, all these things. So we're, mm -hmm. we're kind of rounding it out. I'm, I'm making sure we don't go too fast with it. Have to build it the right way, but excited about it. Uh, Sean's all in on it. You know, Sean's now relocated to Tennessee, so he's got a, a different type of reach as far as where he's at. And so we're just going to see what happens. But we want to make it inclusive, and we but we want to make it right. We don't want it polluted. So then you look at the inside and go, that's not a select kid, right? Mm -hmm. So there might be a, something where it's, it's a select ambition too. You might not be in the select program as far as recognized, but here's the select toolkit. So invest in it and use it. And send me videos of the way you run, the way you hit, the way you play, the way you throw, and we'll know immediately, just like the Instagram video, if you're a select player. Yeah. Right. So you can't that's just wish yourself with statistics. Yeah. No, it's, it's got exactly, to pass the eye test. Well, you're you're yeah. way you're way ahead of this stuff. Yeah. Right. Well, we, we were in the same boat. Like you look up, and you know, we've got some really talented kids in this part of the country that are wearing our logo, and we need to at least have some engagement. What does that look like? Yeah. You know. So that's uh, I think it's really cool. 
Um, What's interesting in softball, Scott, like it's, it's like it's like the alliance or anything else. Not everybody's looking for something, right? How come they're not? So, so we're not a mandate, right? You got to do this. You got to do that. Like there, there are expectations that we're constantly communicating to. But a, a lot of these teams, if, if they're happy with what they're doing and they're subscribing, most of all for us in the culture, right? So just understanding what our culture is about. Don't misrepresent out there. Don't be on the field repeatedly, you know, bad mouth and misbehaving, getting yourself in trouble because then we're probably not cut out for you, right? Yeah. Get in, Have some issues, have, make some mistakes. Hey, we're here to manage you and help you understand things to then make your path better. One very common thing I'm sure you understand, you'll get, we'll get emails from teams that a parent has a concern and say this coach is stealing money or this coach is this or that, you know, financial misconduct is, is the inability to handle money. It doesn't mean that you're buying your tires with it. It just means you didn't know what to do with it. It was in the wrong hand. So we're constantly dealing with these things to help people understand that the, you know, we talk about collective experience with the Alliance. If the parents and coaches in softball would take their collective experience in the professional words, the worlds that they work in on a daily basis and say, hey, your team could use a little more of this. Fundraising, your team could use a little more of this, right? Structure, hey, we do this. Hey, I work in H&R, like, and bring that in to this chaotic thing that we have. Man, then look what's going to happen because I, I think I've said this to you. If Jade wants to take this over for you, do you want her to have the same model that you have, right? You're working hard to build something that she could take over. But the noble coach that goes 10 grand out of his pocket every year to help the families that can't afford it, which I get it. I was a have not. But is that the model you want to hand over to your daughters and to the next generation of, let's say, we bring these young ladies up to where they're running orgs? We don't want them. We want them to know how to fundraise, offset cost, how to create uh, sponsorships, but never fall back on the coach or more hardship on the family. Right. So there's all of these opportunities that we have that I think that's what I'm most excited about. Man, it's very little on the field. I uh, still love the field, but I, I think the thing that I think I'm I'm just had enough of is when I play on the field and there's just this energy from this third base coach or this or that. And, and, and you know, I'm just like, come on, bro. Like this ain't the damn big leagues. I get it, but don't big league me and, and yeah. don't be all hard out here. Like I'm, I'm over that Scotty. Like I've just, uh, I feel like we get a lot more done off the field. I, I still like to go, still like to fight. But I'm over the unevolved part of softball, and I want to be in the part of softball that's evolving, right? And set those standards so that more young coaches can go, you know what? I want to be like that guy. Not just because he wins or she wins. It's because of the type of person they are. And they kick major ass. Okay, that's a good combination right there. That, that's an end. Whether, and there's not enough uh, role models in that space, right? Like, it's us. Uh, yeah. We, it's know. Jamie, you know, Jamie. it's Jamie. start, start. It's Derek Allister. Are you kidding me? It's a lot of times it's the, it's the soft spoken ones, the dominards, the Derek Allisters. These are the patriarchs of what we're doing. And they are amazing. And, and Derek tells a story all the time about what kind of basketball coach he was and, mm -hmm. you know, and he had his moments and stuff, but it's that calming force of you go back to a circle moment here, pulling somebody aside in the heat of the moment and go, Hey, 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 take it down a notch. It's, it's, all, it's all right. It's going to, it's going to work out. I, I or it might not, he, but he and I traveled from Florida to the convention together, and uh, we were stuck in the airport together. And it's really cool when you find you know, like there's no distractions, like there's nowhere for us to go. So we got to sit there, and talk softball, and uh, again, well, that's I'm been the best American. part of the alliance. All, all the people that we're working with. I mean, it's been great yeah. to get to know the, really the Heckers, the uh, all all kinds of people. It's been a lot of fun. No doubt, no doubt. All right, man, so I want to finish up with a passion project that I've – it looks like a passion project. It's something that you have started. I know you didn't do this on your own. I know Holly is very well integrated in this. But talk uh, – let's finish up. I want you to talk about your range pitching academy because when I was down there, I I was really intrigued. Uh, I, was, I was just well beyond that. I was really impressed, but I was really intrigued at what you guys have built and put together. So – Tell people about that and what's what's going on with that. Yeah, the the range pitching academy, uh, you know, the the concept and the system part of that is something I was introduced to when I when I played in college, um, and it's something that I use as a coach to create defensive control or at least you know control as much of the narrative as we could when we're engaging defensively, and it's something that I've always felt could be uh, executed by anybody who pitches because it's, it's basically a target system. So 
doesn't matter if you're shooting a BB gun or a 22 or an AK. <clears throat> if you hit the target, we eat tonight, right? And so, sorry, Holly, for the hunting analogy, but uh, that's that's basically it's and it's a destination oriented system. So where is the pitch ending up as opposed to, I feel like it's like hitting, right? Most of these kids can tell you what they do wrong with their swing. They can tell you about the, how they swing the bat, but most of the kids can't tell me what they're going to do with the bat. Like functionally, where are they, what are they trying to do to the ball? And even yeah. situationally, a lot of them know where they're trying to lift the ball. There's that, but situationally they can't move runners over. It's a lot of stuff like yeah. that. So pitching wise, I feel like a lot of kids talk to us about the origin of the pitch, you know, what their bodies are doing. But I say, let me take you down to the plate here because this is where the action happens. And the very first pitch you throw, if it's middle, middle, guess what? You know, Mia Scott's going to take it yard. So it's like, OK, so we talk a lot about uh, systematic targeting, um, but I think the best part is the culture. And then Holly Pierce is my partner and she has taken on the storytelling, the social media aspect, which is really why the range has blown up the way it has. She's doing a great job of capturing what it is that we're trying to create. We do a, a half hour to 45 minute classroom session. They're hour and a half classes. And then we take the kids in the back. And, you know, the original idea for me came from the shooting range, right? You go to the shooting range, they've got a target up there. You shoot at it. The target comes up to you, tells you how you did. And you rarely see somebody like missing four o'clock at all the shots that it's usually a spray around the whole thing. Right. When you start to realize the pitching, if you did that with a lot of pitchers, most of their misses are in the same spot, right? Low and away off the plate with the curveball. You know, there's a general rule. I tell our kids make the same mistake three times in front of a man and he just loses his stuff and he starts yelling at you. So, you know, it, it, it prevents redundancy. It, 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 um, it promotes and, and, makes pitchers capable, realizing what they can do. And then as they're developing their skills, their spins, their speed, their movement, right? But their ability to compete is not dependent on those things. So you could be an eight-year-old on your first day of playing softball and say, what am I trying to do here? Throw the ball right there, and she's going to hit like this, and you're going to get an out. And when you get three outs, your team gets to hit. So it's it's strategic, specific to all levels. Um, as simple as a rocket a can, BB gun at a can, but now you and I are going to have some conversations and, and really anybody in the industry about this concept and how can we round out the perspective of these pitchers. Uh, bottom line for me, too many pitchers don't feel value. They look at a radar gun and that's their sense of value. They tell you, they throw you this, they tell you they throw this cause they throw it once or twice. I'm trying to work on a middle speed. As soon as I give them their top speed and it's not what they thought they were, their head goes down. I'm like, dude, 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 what is this, man? Like you want to say it's 61 and it's 57 and you think like you're horrible. I, I get that. But let me tell you what we've done with 57, 51 and 42. Like, like it's a perspective thing. So, so that's the range. Uh, I'm, we're having a blast. Uh, Holly and I are doing it now two days a week. We've got four classes and then the online experience is something that we're still kind of creating. We've got a lot of online members, but even that I, I want it to make it so similar to like these conversations, someone sign up for the classes, check out the YouTubes, whatever we're doing and go, Hey, that makes sense. I never thought of it that way. Or I do think of it that way when I watch the Astros or when I watch the Yankees, but I don't think of it that way when I'm coaching my daughter. So it's bridging those two worlds as well too. So uh, if anyone gets a chance, follow the, the range pitching Academy on Instagram, it's free, check it out. And there's a lot of stories on the unique perspective, but it's, it's only unique because other people aren't using it enough. It should be everywhere. So a so sure. little, so quick little background on the range though. It's been a blast, man. I can't tell you how much fun. Uh, I think it's cool. Uh, I think it's, uh, especially coming from the army, I had to go zero my weapon before I could try and qualify, you know, and that's, uh, that was and done. That's how, what I would want to talk about. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Because, because yeah. that, that's self-preservation in that world. Okay. Yeah. For us, I mean, it feels like life or death, but it's not, but you're, you're, yeah. that's self-preservation, your ability to be the one going home at the end of the night. Right. And so target specific. And then as I don't want to say just as a guy, because we're dealing with young ladies, but man, that's fun hitting targets. We still go oh, to carnivals yeah. wanting to hit something and win something by hitting a target. Right. And girls oh, like that no too. Question. So all of a sudden their mind gets into like a, what I call carnival recess, backyard, cornhole, dodgeball. I go, do you guys have to take lessons to play those games? They go, no. Do you have fun? I go, yeah. I go, do you still people get out? Do you still get people out? And they go, yeah. And I go, see, it's it's not always about how you do things. Just get that hitter out. Say that to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Some yeah. kids are like, I've never said that to myself before. Yeah, I don't care how this happens. She doesn't get on base. Get That's her out. it. And, and how about this? Every pitcher makes a mistake. All right. Doesn't feel good. 
but when you can say, Hey, I made a mistake, middle, middle, she hit it out. You know, there was one name you brought up earlier. Uh, I mean, you asked me something, but, uh, we have a mutual family that we work with, with the Vestals and mm -hmm. watching Brooke Vestal get back and be able to play under Trisha, Texas A&M, uh, oh, what an frisbees. amazing young lady, you know, we, you and I, uh, collaborated at the beginning of her when she was at the height of everything. And, and there's no way a 14 year old kid can prepare for all of the scrutiny, criticism, all the things that happen with that. You know, some kids are built for it, but it was awesome to see her, uh, I think it was a, a no hitter a couple of weeks ago, but just spin it. Talk about spins. That kid could spin it. Um, happy to see a kid like that because everybody deserves, you know, a little peace of mind and to smile on that field, uh, be at Davis diamond, have a moment like that. Uh, even if it just once and build upon that, you know, proud to work on, on that kid with you as well too, brother. For sure, man. No, it, it's crazy. Cause I think about, I was thinking about this, uh, when I saw the, what Amanda Scarborough had posted about Brooke yeah. throwing. And she was really highlighting the fact that you don't have to throw 68 to achieve greatness at the collegiate level. This is what it looks like achieving greatness, throwing 62, you know, uh, which some people would couldn't fathom in their own mind. Oh, well, you can play division one power five in the SEC and throw 62. You can, if it spins 2,400. Um, it's and deceptive, that's, right? Yeah, it's, well, she, what she was throwing looked like a frisbee. Like it, it was, it was ridiculous, and it was really cool to watch. But the cool thing is being able to quantify what she's doing now, right? If you could have, if a person could have quantified it back in her day, and not that it, I mean, she ended up at OU. Like that's not the thing. But what I'm right. saying is the value of that picture, right? Being able to be right. quantifiable now to people. Now, when you say to right. someone, "Oh yeah, no, her." Her, her drop ball, her curveball spun 2,400, which that's a real number. Like, that's insane in, in softball, 2,400. It right, did spin right. 2,400. And right. that's not almost not hittable, right? And so when you, when you can – now a young pitcher that goes to the range or anywhere else that hears, like, well, I don't throw 66, 68. Okay, well, let's work on you becoming a different version that can pitch at that level. And that this is what it takes. And this is how we quantify it. And this is what it, this is what it looks like. Because back in the day, you couldn't point at it. You couldn't point at that. Yeah. Well, look, look at the picture at Mac McNeese last year that almost knocked out Washington, right? Mm -hmm. And she was just spinning the ball low and away and just kept hitting it over and over and over. And Washington has a great approach. And it's the way the game works. Like, I mean, you never know. Uh, is the uh, LSU shortstop your kid? She was, yeah. She was. She didn't okay. finish with well, us she last wanted, year. She broke the, broke the well, who broke the scoreboard? Somebody, somebody turned on a ball this weekend. I have a clip of it. A left-handed hitter and seventy-one mile an hour pitch, no, and dude, she was, smoked it yeah, and broke yeah, the scoreboard. Different. Well, that may have been yeah, that may have been Taylor, but been TP. That probably was last Taylor, name. To be honest with you. Taylor Pleasant. Pleasant. Yeah, Pleasant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She broke broke yeah. broke the scoreboard. But it was if you if you could sit it, sit on it, and time it. That was 71, 72. You know, so many kids are, I, I, I get it. I wanted to be Nolan Ryan growing up and I did throw hard and I, and, and I get that. So my arm doesn't work anymore. I get that part of it. We're not talking about the glamour and, and the fan engagement part that we want to see. We're talking about winning. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're talking about winning. We're talking about, about getting on the field, your nine against our nine and let's just go with whatever we have. Right. Because yeah. if it was true, then the, the stronger, the taller, the bigger would always win every boxing, every MMA, but that's, that's not it. So that perspective, 100% of all pitchers can master location. For sure. Okay. So whatever For they sure. can do to master speed, master spin, master move, but 100% of pitchers can master location. There's no requirement other than target practice yeah. and perspective is the, is will create the biggest change because it's now it's how you look at it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if a, a middle, middle pitch is a, a bad pitch and now you're a bad pitcher and you're a disappointment, you have not learned a professional perspective in this game. Yeah. You've, you're a human playing this game, which I get, but this game has evolved where you are more better off taking a professional mental approach, which means what? I'm prepared for everything that happens. And I don't react and respond to things that bring about the negative emotions from this game, right? Just that right there. I made a mistake. She hit it out. Good job. Yeah. Now, if she hits my rise ball or my, my, my corner pitch or, and I spotted that ball well and she hits it out, ooh, I'm not fooling people with my best pitch. Yeah. Now that's an issue. But 
most of these pitchers don't have that problem, Scott. It's look at the catcher's glove on major league home runs and softball home runs. Catcher's glove, thigh high, waist high, it's in or out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's Unless it's down the line, it's usually alley to alley. It's a mistake over the middle of the plate. So minimize Otto, your mistakes. I have this running question. I always ask people I value. So I've asked uh, Mike White. I've asked Beth Serena, especially pitching people, and say, hey, in a controlled environment, like a bullpen session, what is the percentage that a pitcher will hit her intended spot? Right and not miss on the white or miss off the plate where it's not a strike, right? Like you're just missing, right? Some of them right. are right dead middle middle, and some of them are just out of the zone. The running well, they answer is sixty five percent. They hit their spot about, and this is a this is a power. There you go. I just wrote that go. down. I don't know if you can see it, but I just wrote down sixty five. I, do. I can see it. No, and so that's incredible because obviously you you've you've seen and experiences, but I always tell our, tell our players like, okay, think about that for a second. That's in a controlled environment with no fans, no base runners, and they're missing 35% of the time. What, what do you think that number does in game runners at second and third, everyone's screaming, right? It's a tie ball game. What do you think that percentage does then? It's worse than that, right? I promise you it's worse than that. And now let's back it down into our level travel ball. Like, what do you think the number starts to look like? So why are we chasing balls off the plate? Why are you worried about that? They're going to get it on the plate. Or why are we talking about how we swung the bat when we really should be talking about our pitch selection with less than two strikes? Your approach. Because that guy over there who is the crafty, quiet, you don't even know it, he's got us to expand our strike zone below our knees now, 12 out of 16 at-bats. And even with the three tweener singles that we had, great and we scored a run on it that's not the way we want to play the game right i like when when you are talking to the real people that have real tools and they validate what i call the crazy stuff because for me it it came down to a a three out of five right so now we've got a couple other things but these are the rings that we use right and so we're using where greener strikes uh pink is going to represent anything off the plate so expand the strike zone and then blues off speed so when you start to look at a, a net cool. now <clears throat> full of targets, but you've got three specific colors, if you're going out of the box, you're just seeing the pink ones, right? If you want to jump ahead, you hit one of the green ones, then you expand to one of the pink ones, right? We, we have our, our, our change up pitches in, di- in different spots. The only one we can't, it's kind of hard is dirtying the change. And that is being able to put a, uh, being able to put a ring on the ground and be able to bounce a change up because that's, that's dirtying the ball is very, very important to us. Yeah. So three out of five is what we, we throw sets of five pitches. And again, just to explain it to someone, you're, you're throwing sets of five, capturing each sets of five pitches, adjusting around the target until you hit that spot and increase your efficiency three out of five. If you obsess on the three out of five, then chances are you're anxious, you're not in a good mindset, and then you're making the same mistake missing left of the target. So an eight-year-old could miss 10 balls above the target, or like we'll say in our classes, okay, you just scared a bird, now scare a gopher. It doesn't matter how bad she misses the target. And I'll tell that dad that's all like wound up about, oh, you got to do this. And he starts repeating what the pitching Mm -hmm. instructor says. I go, bro, tell her she's amazing for consciously throwing to the other side of the ring. Because what's going to happen is if this is the ring and she misses 10 here, and then she misses 10 here, there's the average. Mm -hmm. Right. So you find the average. You're always going to find the average if you create a parameter on both sides. So if she's missing high, then she's got to miss low and in the middle of those two. So if she's only missing high, the average is still on the wrong side of it. It's it's Mm -hmm. it's really simple. And then what happens is like I would say, don't catch your daughter on the bucket all the time because now it's east west and those east west pitches now have a very small margin for error. As soon as those east west pitches come in here, bye bye. They have to be here and they have to be here. Yeah. Right. And some of these pitchers, you know, again, they, they're very efficient with it. So below the knees, up above, bounce the ball. Dad should not, and mom should not be signed up to get hit in the shins. And you certainly shouldn't be getting your daughter getting mad at her if she's working hey. on that on yeah. purpose. Right. Yeah. But I also don't yeah. want to take away the, hey, have a catch with my daughter. I get that. You'll never forget that. So catch her for 20 minutes. Then, get, dude, get a piece of duct tape. This isn't about selling the rings. Right. But get a piece of duct tape. And let her practice target. Pra- and then stand there and go, I bet I can hit that tape more times than you. Or I can come closer to the target. Now your daughter's going to want to beat you instead of you yelling at her getting or telling her what she's doing wrong all the time. And now she's more inspired and motivated to beat you. You know how much our, our players love to beat us, Scotty? 
I mean, just walking up in the cage and put a ball on the tee and go, I bet I can hit that mark in one swing closer than you can. Right. The kid, right away, the kid will go up. All right, let's go coach. Right. And then afterwards I go, you're the queen for the day. And they love that. They love to beat us. Right. So that's just, again, it's a perspective on teaching, but it's through the way we learned, which was recess over the line, wiffle ball, uh, pepper, uh, I'll just say Nerf football games. I can't really say the names of the games anymore, but they were, they were just all things that we, we grew up playing. Right. All the stuff that worked. That's it. Well, bro, everything's just a story. Thank you so much. You know how much I appreciate uh, your time and uh, you and I sat and bullshitted this whole time. And that's what it was supposed to be. And that's why we, that's why I've created this is, is to be able to just talk the game and hopefully some people out there enjoyed uh, what we talked about. And if they didn't, uh, you know, I don't know what to tell him because I think you're a funny son of a bitch. So, you know, it's all good. Well, if you're if you're if you're if you're bomber folks, your bomber people, right? Only know maybe the the competition side of us, uh, and then they're like, "Oh man, okay." And you, you start off with me talking about myself, so they don't want to they don't want to hear that stuff. But if they if they stuck with us a little bit, they're going to see that these relationships, yeah. and again, over the years, are are more important than you know the accolades are what we do on the field, but they're not who we are. This, this yeah. is like who we are. So this is not anything new. I, you know how much I appreciate you, how much our programs appreciate each other. And I just love that we're in the creative space, Scotty, because uh, there's no end. You know what you've done with merch, what you've done with your design, your brand. I mean, we're everybody's watching all the time. And that's how we learn. I, I want to be like the comedians. They promote each other. They support each other. They, they do each other's podcasts. Uh, they talk to each other about following whatever it is. I don't even know what to firecrackers TV. Neither one of us can be so Cat media. Williams, though. We can't be Cat. None, no one can be Cat Williams in, the, in this. Case. No, but but we'll but we'll find Cat to come out and <laughs> tell will. him the way there it is. is. A Cat Williams I, among I, us. I think I think we might be able to find one or two. Uh, I It'll, promise it, you. It's called I Get Real you. with So and So. That's so. it. Anyways, well, appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, absolutely, bro. I appreciate to you. it. Thank you guys, and thanks for everybody that stuck on here and listened to us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great one.